the storyline now is that Jesus is risen from the dead. And some of the things that happened after that, um, how he was seen uh, by, uh, in, in fact, by this particular story that we're looking at, he had already appeared twice in the scriptures. We know that he had appeared um, to um, the, a couple of the disciples on the road to Emmaus and talk with them and then reveal himself. And then he re- revealed himself to the, the group of people that, uh, that, that had been there in, in town. The, the, the disciples again, he appeared to them and ate with them and stayed with them. And so there had been a couple times now that he's already appeared to them but, um, but let me give you kind of a, where we're headed, let me give you a little bit of a background to a couple particular points that will help make sense of the story as we, we go along. Before Jesus went to the cross, he had been with the disciples, and as he was talking with them, he had told them that he was going to, you know, he was going to die, he was going to the cross, and he uh, had told them, based upon scripture um, that, uh, that they would be fleeing from him, that they would in fact deny him, that they were going to, to, to stumble. And that's the exact words he used. In fact, in, in Mark chapter 14 and verse 29, it, um, uh, as Jesus had said, you will all stumble because of me, you're all going to deny me. Peter s- jumps in in the story, in verse 29, it says, uh, Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. And we, 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 knowing the story, you know, further on, we know that, you know, Peter was, he was a little get, bit arrogant in this because he, it, it would have been one thing for him to just say, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to deny you. I'm not going to do that. But he adds, even if they do, you know, it's possible they will, but not me. There's something there of a little bit of, of pride, I think, in the statement of Peter. And we see this uh, kind of play out. And then, and then what we see is Peter does. And Jesus actually said, uh, assuredly, I say to you that, 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 uh, uh, that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Before morning, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what happened. And Peter, in, in, uh, in Luke 22, um, <clears throat> he was asked, they had asked him, um, you know, aren't you the, the, from the Nazarene? Aren't you following him? Aren't you, you know, following, aren't you one of his followers? And he, he said, no. And then he said no again. And then he cursed and said no. Because, you know, the disciples don't curse. But he was like, he, he's getting to the place where he's doing everything to, you know, distance himself from Jesus. He hears the crow. He hears, the, I mean, the, not the crow, but the, uh, he hears the rooster crow. And, and then he remembers the words of the Lord. And he sees from a distance Jesus, it says, looking at him. And, and he, he falls down and, uh, and he weeps bitterly, the scripture says. He wept, he wept. There was a brokenness that had happened in Peter when he realized that, that even though he, was, he said he would never, he did. Have you ever said you would never? And you did. That that I, I think this story is a story really of of restoration, reconciliation, um, regeneration, and rejuvenation. I got all the R's in there. <laughs> but the point is, um, Jesus. I, I think in this story, you're gonna not. It's not. It's not just forgiveness, and I don't want to use, I, I, I hesitate using just forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big deal. But it's more than forgiveness. It's a restoration. And Peter deeply needs this. And then what we see is afterward, Peter's, 
you know, one of the first, I mean, they're, they're at the, they go to the, the tomb and, and the Lord's gone. But as, as uh, Jesus appears himself, appears to uh, Mary and, and Martha and, uh, and others, that, that when he does that, he, he tells them to go tell the disciples it tells us in, um, in Mark chapter 16, verse 7, that says, go tell his disciples, you know, that he is risen. He says, he says tell the disciples, and then he adds, and Peter. He, he wants Peter to get specific information here. He's, he doesn't want it just to be the group. He knows Peter needs something. And he's going to give Peter what he needs and, uh, and, and cared for. So it says, so, so he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Now, Jesus, G- the angel said that actually, and, but Jesus also said, um, go, uh, to, said to them, uh, I'll see you in, in Galilee. Meet me in Galilee. So both um, the angel told um, the, the, the ladies, but Jesus also said, so what you're gonna, what we see is that Jesus is planning on meeting them in Galilee. Now that's you know the other side of the the, the country, pretty much. They're going to be going up up north, and they're going to be, I mean, uh, 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 they're going to go up north, and they're going to see Jesus. Jesus is going to meet them there, and so what happens as we read the story? Let's take a look at John chapter two, verse one. Now these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, that's the Sea of Galilee, and in his way he showed him, in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, Cana of, Ga- uh, of Cana of Galilee, the son of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples are, are, were together. So seven of them were hanging out. They probably were all the fishermen, you know, they're, they're that group that are hanging out. And it said two others, which is interesting. It doesn't name all the disciples because why? It's not important. It's not important. We think that every person's name or, the, you know, the, the, their, their position is important to God. Everybody's important. So it says, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Now, Peter still got the leadership gift. He hasn't lost that. That's who he is. If, if, if Peter's around, people are going to follow because that's Peter. And so Peter's with them and, um, and he says, I'm going fishing. Now, it might be, and just, it might be just that because they've kind of lost their livelihood. How they were sustained is that people, as Jesus would go around, people would give to the ministry. Um, if you remember, Judas was the one who held the, 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 the finances, and that's how they kind of took, were taken care of. But now that's all gone. Now, maybe the need to go fishing is a need just for you know, sustenance, just so that they can, you know, but maybe it's more than that because it was, in fact, what Jesus called them out of. If, it, if you see, it wasn't, it, their calling meant for them, at least, to leave everything and to come follow him. And now they're going back to the place where they were. And I don't say that that's rebellion in them at all, but it's a lost kind of hope that they had. It's kind of a lost, well, what do we do now kind of thing. But maybe it's more for Peter. And we see why when Jesus kind of singles him out in this story, that there's something more going on in the heart of Peter. And I think it has to do with his failure. I mean, he, he obviously, when he was weeping, he was in brokenness, repentance in his heart and all of that. But I wonder if Peter kind of thought, well, since I've done that. Remember, Jesus made some pretty strong statements about denying him. 
He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the father. And he's talking about an eternal, you know, element here. And I'm wondering if Peter has come to the place in his heart that he really doesn't think he has a call on him anymore, that God is kind of, you know, he's gone too far. And a lot of people, that's, the enemy throws that at people. You've gone too far. God can't use you. You've, you know, you've wasted too much time. You should have, you know, you should have stuck with it. You should have, you know, you, you shouldn't have gone down that road. And some of us, we put ourselves in kind of a, a ministry purgatory. And, and, and we put ourselves in a place where God would not put us. And I think this is an example. It's not just for Peter, but it's an example for us. That many of us have been in a similar place and maybe are now in a similar place as Peter was. And we're just kind of like, well, let's just go fishing. Let, you know, my career is the important thing. You know, how I... How I um, you know, what I do in life, it's all, that's what's important now. Um, I, you know, still, I still will love God and still care and still maybe be part of the church, but all, be, beyond that, that's, that's all in the past. That's gone. It's over. I'm, the Lord certainly can't use me now like that. And Peter, I'm sure, had those kinds of thoughts going through his head. And as he was, says he's going fishing, and they said to him, we're going with you, right? Because wherever Peter goes, people go. And uh, so they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now these are professional, the, these, these guys are generational fishermen. I mean, they're not just like some guys that kind of started fishing. Their dad had a fishing business. Their grandpa had a fishing business. This was something that was passed on from generation to generation. This is how they lived. This is how they survived. To own a boat or to own several boats, that was something. Actually, you, you had to have some, some resources for that. Not everybody can own a boat in those days. And... Um, and so they get in the boat. They, this, this is what they do. They know where all the good fishing spots are. They've got it down. They know all, you know, they know how to cast the nets. They're, they're professional. This isn't a group of guys just trying to catch something. They would expect, after, because this is what they do, they're going to come back with fish. You go fishing, you come back with fish because that's what you do. Not this night. This night, wherever they cast the net, the fish flee. And I think God has something to do with it. And so they cast the net and they're getting nothing. And God's trying to speak to them. God wants to say something. Why aren't we fruitful? Why isn't it happening? <clears throat> it said, but when the morning had come, now come, Jesus stood on the shore. So Jesus shows up, they're at, in Galilee, they're, you know, where they should be, but they're, and they're on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and it's from a distance. And the disciples didn't know it was him. They, they, you know, maybe it was far enough away that they couldn't recognize him, his voice, maybe even the way he was dressed, maybe it's something different now that he's resurrected. And there's some indication that possibly the scars... And the beatings that he took disfigured the Lord. And you don't think about that, but he carried that with him. You know, we, th we get this picture of this glowing kind of resurrection and everything's perfect. And he has these beautiful dark blue eyes, even though he was, you know, maybe not have been blonde. Just maybe. <laughs> It isn't important, is it? That's why the Bible doesn't give us all those details. But the point was simply this, that 
they didn't recognize him. And he's probably at a you know, far enough distance. And he, he, says, he says to them, uh, children, which actually some say this is really kind of a bad translation because it also should be translated lads or in our day kind of buddy, buddy, you know, come on, uh, you know, friends, whatever. You're just getting attention, homies, um, come on. <laughs> He says, have any of you food? And, and they answered him, no, no food. And he said to them, cast the net on the other side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, you got to get this picture because I think we think of a, like a fishing boat, like this big, you know, like today's fishing boat. You have these huge boats and, and their, you know, nets are on this side and, you know, it's way over there. And they go all the way to the other side of the boat to cast the net. Net, we, we actually know what the boats look like. They, they actually have found first century fishing boats. There's seven, let's see, this is eight feet halfway. They're seven feet wide. So they, so it's like, <laughs> do, do, do you kind of get the ridiculousness of it? It's like this side of the boat, you know, and then this side of the boat. So what's the difference? And they've been going all night. And Jesus and Jesus is telling them, of course, they don't know it's Jesus. And that's also kind of uh, an interesting thing because um, they were listen, willing at this point to listen to a stranger. I, I think when you've had enough failures, you're, you're trying to grasp anything. I, I think in our lives, sometimes we're vulnerable to the wrong voice. And there's this constant searching that's going on in so many people's lives. They find failure after failure, and what they end up turning to is, well, just, you know, they'll, they'll turn to some kind of religious practice. They'll, you know, they, they, need to, they need a spiritual coach, you know, or they need, a, you know, they, they, need, they need a self-help group. They need all these things. And we're always, we're grasping for things. And we're more vulnerable to hear things. But we're also maybe potentially more able to hear the voice of the Lord. Because Jesus is speaking now. And Jesus is speaking in our lives when we find ourselves and we've tried, we've done our best, we, we, we did everything we knew and we're still empty. We still don't have it. And Jesus wants to speak. And he speaks to them and he gives them direction. Other side of the boat. Now, it had nothing to do with the right side of the boat or the left side of the boat. It has everything to do with or without God's guidance. That's the, the, the whole thing. It's... It's either with God's guidance or without God's guidance. And in our life, that's how it works as well. Is it going to be with God's guidance or is it going to be without God's guidance? What is God speaking? What is God saying? Sometimes we're trying to find that. We go through, and I, I think there is benefit. Scripturally, it tells us there's benefit in godly counsel in our lives. Godly, can I say that over? Godly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. And in that he meditates day and night. Where's the counsel? The counsel comes from the word of God. And if it comes through an individual, they better be people of the word of God. And they better be people who are giving you the word of God. If you have a 
close friend that you get counsel from, if you have a counselor that you go to and they don't give you God's word, leave as fast as you can. As fast as you can. I have, over the years, many times sat with people who are struggling in their life and they'll tell me they've been going to a, a, a counselor and they're a licensed therapist. And I'm okay. I'm okay. Good. The person got some, you know, study behind them maybe. Ah, so um, wh- what are the scriptures they're giving you? Oh, they never did, said, um, do they pray with you? No. Are, are they? You said they're a Christian counselor? What church do they go to? Have you ever asked that question? Oh, I don't think I can ask that. They, they wouldn't. Well, you're supposed to, you know that you're supposed to interview? You interview those, that person. If you go to a counselor, have you interviewed them? Find out where their faith is? Their, their value of God's word in, in, in their life. Because if not, you are under the counsel of the ungodly. And you won't get good counsel. I, I know I'm going sideways here on this. I'm, I'm going off a, a little bit. But this is, I think it's for somebody. I think this is important. That some of you keep going through a process where you're getting counsel. And it sounds good, but it's not from God and the, the, the difference between going back to the story the difference between it, you know it's not between this side of the boat or that side of the boat it's between God's guidance or not God's guidance and the fruitfulness comes when we walk in obedience Jesus wants you to be successful fishing. He wants you to be successful. It's important. Now, obviously, it's not about fish because they have already been called not to fish for fish, but to fish for people. That's what they've been called to do. And so it's really, this is a message. This is a story of how to fish for people and And Jesus tells you what side of the boat to throw your nets. And we have to be listening to Jesus in that because if we don't listen, we'll be just as empty and without fruitfulness in our own lives. So they cast now and they were not able to draw it it in because of the multitude of fish. Now they they just go this side and they they got so much fish because now all the fish somehow, for some reason, all go to the net. They were running away from the net. Now they're running to the net. And they pull it up. And actually, not all the fish went to the net. Just the big ones. <laughs> and that's what the scripture says. And so they cast it, and they, were, they weren't able to draw it in. And, uh, and it's interesting because this story is a repeat there, there's a different story. There's another, it's, a, it's another story. It's not the same story. But in Luke chapter 5, at the call, when Jesus went out and called the disciples, at the time of the call, there was a similar story where they were fishing, couldn't catch anything. Jesus did, told the same thing, do it on the other side. And then there was a difference to the story. In this one, you'll see Peter come, you know, f- f- swimming toward Jesus In that story, Peter falls on his knees and he says, depart from me. You know, I'm a sinful man. Kind of a lot like, uh, you know, what what Isaiah went through in that recognition of his, his sinfulness when he recognized who it is that did this. And so it says, therefore, that that disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So you see, they were called in the same miracle that's happening now. And, and the disciple whom Jesus loved is the writer, right? It's John. 
John's writing this, and he says, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And now, this, and now when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on his own outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged into the sea. Now, he probably just had his loincloth on. You know, they're out fishing with just the guys. The loincloth is kind of like their, you know, swimsuit. Um, but... Just, just for information, guys, you, don't, you can't use this as an excuse to wear a Speedo. <laughs> okay. Now, now, verse 9. But the other disciples came to the little boat, and they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. So they're, they're dragging it. And then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. So they hadn't even brought their fish in, but Jesus is now cooking fish already. He's already got fish. He's got the bread. You know, he's got the fire going. And, uh, and he says to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Now here's the point. Jesus doesn't need your fish. He just wants you to experience his provision and blessing. He loves to partner with us. So go ahead and bring some of your fish. But he's already got the fish. And he's already got the bread. And he doesn't need anything. What we bring to Jesus isn't something to fulfill his need. It's something that fulfills our need. Whenever we come and bring... Jesus does not need, God does not need our worship. It isn't like when we worship, God is going, oh, I just needed that. Not at all. It fulfills our need. It's who we were made to be. When we serve the Lord, it isn't God saying, boy, I really needed you to do that. I'm so glad you did that. No, we needed it. We, we need to serve the Lord. We need to, to give to the Lord. We need to, to honor the Lord. We need to glorify God. We need that in our lives. It said, <clears throat> Simon Peter went up and dragged the net uh, to land full of large fishes. So Peter goes up and he grabs a hold of the nets and he drags it in. <clears throat> And there's 153. And although there were so many, and the net was not broken. So you see that? He says that there was, there was still, this was a lot of fish for their, for their kind of net, their strength of their nets. And there's 153. Now there has been almost you know, books read, I mean, written about what that 153 is about. I mean, people jump into every kind of category. I've heard one say that the 100 represent the Gentiles, the 50 represents the Jews, and the three represent the Trinity. I mean, you, you got, the, the list goes on and on. I want to ask you this. If you're a fisherman, if you've gone fishing, have you ever have you ever gone home and didn't know how many fish you caught? Of course you did. You counted them. They probably weren't 153, but, you know, two, three, you know, on a good day, 10, I don't know. But you count. And uh, I remember a day off the shore of Huntington Beach Pier. I don't think this happens nowadays, but we, we pulled in over a hundred Benita, me, and, a, me and, and my cousin, in one day, a hundred Benita, over a hundred, and, uh, and, and I don't know, you, can you do that today? I mean, is there anybody on the end of the pier can still catch, huh? There's limits now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> One night we caught seven sand sharks off the pier. We we're kids. We could do that. You could stay off the pier. I don't know. I'm talk telling you this. It's not important. <laughs> we threw them on top of the, you know, the end of the restaurant at the end of the pier? Okay. <laughs> they came in and there were sharks on top. <clears throat> 
I've repented. <laughs> kind of. Okay. It, it says, um, verse 12, it says, Jesus said to them, come and eat, eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. And uh, like I said, possibly um, a part of the, the issue might have been um, the remainder of the beatings and the scars that Jesus took. Remember when he rose, he still had, you know, he said, put your hand, put your finger. And the scars were still there. What would make you think that the others weren't? The crown of thorns, the beatings and all that weren't part of the visible um, result of the crucifixion that still remained in Christ when they saw him. Until he was in his resurrected state, of course, John saw him in a whole different way. Eyes of flame of fire, you know, that, that whole. But um, <clears throat> it says, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. Now, Jesus is still serving this is the resurrected Jesus. He gets there. He brings, you know, however he does it. He has, he, has, he has fish and he has bread and he's cooking the fire and he's making breakfast for the guys. This is the king of kings and lord of lords. Everybody should be bowing their knee to him and, and rightfully. And he's serving. He's serving. Can I just say this to you? Never, never follow a leader who is too important to serve. I want to say that again. Never follow a leader who is too important to serve. I, I remember this fallen pastor evangelist. I remember everywhere he went, he had a team that took care of every single thing. He never lifted up his Bible. He never lifted up his suitcase. Everybody was there to serve him. Pride caused his fall. I think part of the pride is I am just too important. Everybody needs to serve me. I have the gift. Well, Jesus had the gift and it didn't stop him from taking, taking a, a rag and kneeling down and washing the disciples' feet. And it, didn't, it wasn't below him to sit and make breakfast for the disciples. He was a true servant leader that we should emulate in our lives. And it, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and Scripture says, and this was the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he had raised from the dead. And when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me? And then he adds more than these. Recalling what we read earlier that all, you know, even though all of them, you know, I mean, if they did disown you, if they, you know, deny you, I won't. I won't. Because I love you more than they do. I think this is bringing something to remembrance in, for Peter. I mean, obviously it's got to be uncomfortable. He's called out specifically of the group, in front of the group, and Jesus is saying, is asking him, do you love me more than these? And there are different interpretations of that. Is he saying more than these means the fish? Do you love, do you love me more than these fish or fishing? Do you love me more than, um, you know, than this whole, uh, this whole business, this life? Or, but I think it's, to me, it's pretty clear that at least I see it as he's asking, do you love me more than the, not, not that you love, do you love me more than you love them, but do you love me more than they love me? Do you love me more than them? And the answer, you know, and, and, he, and Peter doesn't say, I love you more, more than they do. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. 
He responds not to more than these, but he responds to simply, I love you. I love you. Now, something's going on here in the wording that we have to bring out. And that is, um, in, in the Greek um, New Testament, um, there are three words you. There, there's more Greek words for love than that. In fact, there's four main, and from what I understand, there's even more than that. Um, as far as words that can be used or be, would be in, in English translated love. But there's a distinction in these words, and the Greek words themselves gives us more distinction. And, uh, and two are being used in this story. Jesus is ref- using uh, both of them, and, and, uh, and, and Peter's using one of the words. And the, the first word of the two is agape, or agapeo, or, and the second one is phileo, or phileia. And um, th- those two words, one uh, agapeo re- means it's, a, it's the highest level of love. Let's put it that way. It's the highest level. It's the level of love that I, you, I could have for you even if you don't deserve it. Or God would ha- has it for us even though the, 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 part, the person receiving the love doesn't have to deserve the love. The, the phileo love is a, it's a valued love, it's a, it's a high level of love, but it's a brotherly love. It's kind of where we get, you know, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love is referred to. That, that, that love is, is not quite the level of love as agape. Now, some, some commentators say, you know, it really doesn't matter, but I think it matters because it was distinctive. It's in the text. Now, some would say it doesn't matter because Jesus spoke Aramaic, which is kind of a um, Chaldean, a, much more complicated from what I understand than this, but kind of a Chaldean Hebrew uh, mixture that was uh, kind of the language that the Jews used in those days, not pure Hebrew. They used Aramaic, though Jesus spoke, would have spoke Greek, Hebrew, because that was the language of the Old Testament, and uh, and and uh, he uh, so he would have known the languages. So, G- but when Jesus spoke Aramaic, they'd say, "Well, there wasn't this distinction." But the Holy Spirit, anointing John to write it, brought out this distinction. So it must be important to the. To, to us, to God, that we see the distinction. And let me just explain how it goes. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with the deepest love? And Peter's response is, Lord, you know, I phileo, I friendship, love you. I brotherly, I brotherly love you. He, he doesn't bring it to the high, that highest level. And so, um, Jesus says to him, and I think this is the goal. He says to him, feed my lambs. I, you, 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 fishing is no longer your main, you know, career here. This is not what your life is about. Feed my lambs. He's not talking about physical feed. He's talking about spiritual feed. He's talking about giving the word of God to young believers, lambs. He says, this is what I want you to do. Now, then he asked Peter again. Again, a second time, he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And Simon must be going, what is going on here? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I Phileo you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Do you wonder if Peter is connecting his bold, I would say, boastful conversation with Jesus? Maybe he's connecting when he said, I, you know, I, though they, 
Let me tell you about me. I'll never, I'll never do that again. I'll never do that. I added the again because I think some of you, that's, your, that's what's going on in some of your hearts right now. I'll never do that. I'll never do that. And then Jesus said, tend my sheep. Be a shepherd. Care for the people. You notice Jesus doesn't respond. And Jesus doesn't even say, you mean you don't agape me? Maybe Peter is now being a little bit more honest with himself. He certainly is not as boastful. He's humbled now. That he's not going to say, oh yeah, Lord, I have the deepest love for you because I think he's not sure. And I think that's true for all of us when it's real. I mean, do you, do you love God more than anything? I'm telling you, you might honestly for me, sometimes. Sometimes. I, 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 I would want to, I do want to, always have the Lord first in my life in every way. And I want to love him. And this agape love has nothing, to, well, say nothing to do, but it's not dependent on emotion at all. You can fully agape and have no emotional attachment. And you can fully agape and have all kinds of emotional attachment. But it's not required. It's just, I'm going to serve and put that person first. And their cares and their needs are the most important. And so, the conversation goes on. And he said to him, the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Now Jesus has taken it down. Okay, let's come to where you are, Simon. And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, Peter had denied the Lord three times. The Lord restores him three times. Spurgeon said this, a man's repentance should be as notorious as his sin. If it's public, his repentance needs to be public. If if it's private, his repentance needs to be private. Peter is being dealt with to a place that is best for him in his restoration. It's, It's actually good that this is being done in front of the disciples because it was known by the disciples. And Jesus is bringing him back. See, the restoration is full, it's complete. He's restoring him not just to where he was. He's restoring him beyond where he was because that's the restoration of God. The restoration of God is not to get you back to where you were. The restoration of God is to get you beyond where you were in your life. And... Then he gives him a glimpse of the future, and he says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you wish. But when you are old, now here's the word. Here's the point. Peter, you're going to get to be old. Now, what kind of word? That's kind of encouraging. You know, I mean, we're not all, uh, you know, assured of that. I mean, I think it's why maybe when Peter was put in prison, he was singing at, night, at nighttime, worshiping. He wasn't worried about being killed. Jesus has said, you're going to get old. Listen, the promises of God can do for you what nothing else can do for you. And Peter has a promise. When you're old, and he says, you will stretch out your hand. Now, this isn't so exciting. You will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Now, that that was a euphemism in that time when you stretch out your hands is, uh, for crucifixion. In other words, Peter, you're going to be crucified. And 
um, tradition has it that Peter was crucified. He, in fact, tradition has that his wife was also um, crucified. I guess Eusebius said that um, she was one of the few women who were martyred through crucifixion herself. And that Peter had said to her simply um, in the last moments was, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord, he says to his wife. And, uh, but Peter was crucified. Uh, tradition has it that it, he was crucified upside down. And, uh, and he says, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish to go, right? Uh, and, and this he spoke specific, specifying by what death he would glorify God. So I would just say this um, to you, um, uh, t- t- to you prophecy buffs. Peter was never an any moment um, believer in the second coming of Jesus. He, 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 he never, he actually knew that he was going to die before Jesus came back. And so it says when he had spoke this, he said to him, follow me. You're going to get old. This is how you're going to die. Peter, follow me. Can you hear Jesus say that to you? That's what he's saying to you. Follow me. And Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. This makes me crack up. It says, because John is writing this, right? So he doesn't just say he turns to John or turns to, even if he wants to say the disciple who Jesus loved, but he says he turned to the disciple who Jesus loved, uh, uh, following, who also had leaned on the breast uh, uh, at the supper, and the Lord who is the one who betrays you and was told to the, that Jesus told him, you're the one, uh, the, he asked the Lord, who's the one will betray me. So John just kind of jumps in, in, you know, in the story and he says, this is, he, he, Peter turns to the guy who Jesus loved, talking about himself, who was leaning on the breast of Jesus at the last supper and, um, and who uh, asked Jesus who was going to betray him. And, uh, you know, the, the, the real important disciple, you know, that one. Anyhow, and Peter, seeing him, uh, <laughs> said to Jesus, but, the, uh, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that this man remain till I come, what is that to you? Because Peter's just asking, I, you know, what about him? But it doesn't matter. It's not a comparison thing. You're going to, going to the cross. He's going to an island. It's going to be different. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you follow me. And this one, this saying went out. There were people who thought that, that he was saying that John would never die, but he never made that statement. He just said, basically, what does it matter to you? And there are also many other things that Jesus did, John finishes, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Amen. We're getting just a glimpse is what he's saying. There's so much. I... I believe this whole message, there's been inter- interaction. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to some of you. And there are people here that you have, in your mind, you cross the line. In your mind. In your mind, you went too far at one point. You did that what you said you would never do. Maybe that's your story. But however you got to this point, if you are even at all in the point in your life where, like, you know, you're at church, obviously, the, the Sunday after Easter, you're here. You're in church. But my question to you is this. Are you just going fishing? Is that what your life is about now? You're going to live it out? 
or are you going to take the call of God that has never left, the gifts and calling of God, or without, without repentance, that call has never left. And you can't, don't, Peter doesn't need to look back at the time missed. It's not about the time missed. It's about the time you're in with Jesus right now. It's that time. And for Peter, Jesus kept repeating, get back to the job. Go, you know, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, care for my sheep, follow me. That's the point.